So I'll ask a couple of questions first, and then, of course, there is uh, time for you to ask your questions. So first of all, when did you make this documentary, and how did you get this idea? Did you know uh, um, Frank Aram and Dario Fo personally, uh, or how was the idea uh, originally? So we made it in uh, 1996. I don't know if we need it. Maybe okay. we can register. We made it in 1996, and uh, the connection that we had with uh, Dario and Franca is because Filippo Stad was a very famous political lawyer. Very that we active, saw in the documentary. Yeah, very active with the human rights and in the political movement. So mm, that was, and of course, uh, you, you're the right person to talk about it, but the access was incredible because Filippo grew up uh, in the midst of uh, them calling his dad in the middle of the night because they would write and rewrite their scripts based also on the political events that were developing and with the help of all the lawyers. And they were querelati, that I don't know how to say they, in English. They were sued. were sued constantly by the politicians and all the establishment. And uh, there were a number of political lawyers that would uh, represent them pro bono. And this went on for many years. So tell us something of what it was like to grow up in your household with your father being this very engaged uh, lawyer, not only for uh, Franco, uh, Franca and Dario, but also for a, a cadre of uh, very prominent political uh, personalities that in those years we just want to remind for our American friends that might not necessarily be very familiar with Italian history, especially the 70s and the early 80s. Uh, there were years that in Italy were dominated by political violence, two different kinds, two very different kinds, uh, but it was basically the daily uh, facts of, of Chronicle were uh, inspired by a very tense political situation and of course by an, an answer of the institution that was very often, as we heard also in the documentary, uh, dominated by violent reaction, restriction of personal freedoms and of civil rights, um, inhumane situ uh, situations within prisons. So tell us a bit of what to was like to grow up in that kind of environment? It, w it was pretty intense, I remember, um, uh, because, of course, uh, Dario and Franca were putting on stage uh, many uh, theater shows that were related to the present political situation. But their genius, I think, especially Dario and Franca's genius, was that they were translating the, the, the situation, the things that were happening every day, into art. Uh, so their shows were not didascalic, they were not um, traditional. They, they took um, um, inspiration from what was happening every... And I, I have fond memories because I was a seven, eight-year-old kid at the time, and I, I was living at the Palazzina Liberté that was one of the main points where there were debates, there were, they were you know, uh, rehearsing their shows before they went on, on stage on the official side. And every night, my father was called, and I, I, I went there, actually, to see the shows, I remember, when I was a kid. And I remember sometimes my father was telling me that the police would come in in the evening, and they would stop the shows, saying that some security was at stake, and there were problems. So they were trying to stop their productions, but they eventually it was could not. not. What, what they were saying before, it was like soft censorship, in the sense that, of course, in Italy, you cannot censor a theatrical piece saying it's against uh, the law, but you can come up and say uh, safety conditions are not uh, up to the code, and there are, there is an issue of uh, security, exactly. and you can stop or interrupt or preventing a show from Absolutely. going. Absolutely, and then they were sued many times for uh, defamation, libel, because yeah. the libel, and they would, of course, many of those shows, especially the accidental death of an anarchist, was putting on stage something that really happened in in Milan in, in Milan. 1969 when. An anarchist died falling out of, off of a window. That in, was the version Europe. of the police. That was the version of the police, of course. The police said that actually um, the anarchist 
threw himself out of the window because he was, you know, he was guilty of what he had done. And, but then there was an entire movement that demonstrated the opposite, that the police actually uh, was, you know, guilty of, of actually throwing, uh, throwing him out of the window. So that the whole show of Dario Fo, again, was taking uh, inspiration from what happened and also from the, the courts. Because my, my father was telling me that they, they, when they were preparing the trial for the next day, and he would go to Dario and Franca and discuss of the strategy they would need to follow the following day, mm -hmm. uh, Dario was actually rehearsing the judges that the next day <laughs> were going to decide that, that case. You know, it was very funny. So he was like a, a show in itself, you know. And my father was telling Dario, please, let's get serious. We have a trial today. We could lose it. So we have to be serious here. It's not the other. And Dario said, no, it is, actually, and, and I, I show you how. So it, was, it must have been very fun, especially for my, my father doing this, even pro bono, but it was mm -hmm. a very intense. And, and I remember, again, going to the shows and to the, to the rehearsals, in particular, when the, we were like the four, four people, my, my family, maybe a friend, a close friend, and we were seeing the, the show that was you know, growing and it was going to be opening the next day or so. So that's one of the remarkable features of their theater, that there are some elements that are recurrent again and again. And, and you did very well in the, in the montage, in the editing, that you showed that in the monologue of uh, Boniface VIII as he is um, donning the, the paraments, uh, that it, it goes like from a decade to the other and it's like seamless. It, and then there were things that changed completely every day, and that was based on on the political happenings or, or chronicle happenings of, of the day. So that's g the great ability that they had to combine a sort of a canon of their own, the Zanni elements of the Gramlo, the, and then things that were ripped of the headlines of the newspapers. How they combined these uh, everlasting uh, and you could say eternal, like archetypes of theater with daily life. That's an incredible um, I think achievement. That Dario, that unfortunately is not here anymore, but uh, he was the most translated living uh, playwright mm -hmm. until he was alive. And the reason why, because as you said, he was able to build this skeleton that are evergreen of this canovacci. And, and then renew the meaning over and over and over everywhere and over a span of 50, 60 years of uh, their career. And if you think of the Icaro, which is so, you know, you can really apply it to modern life. And, and the, the, the idea is, I think their strength was that they were the first one, and especially in Italy, to listen to, and those were the 70s, to the working class, and I remember Franca uh, spending days uh, talking about how she was coming from a family of professional theaters, of puppeteers. And uh, so sh they were like middle class and they, were, they started that way and they were actually the first ones to go towards the working class. And th those were times where the polarization between working class and upper middle class was so strong. And, uh, and actually, uh, he was saying that about the rehearsing, and Franca said they would invite entire families when they were writing the pieces themselves, asking all these working, they would go to the factories mm -hmm. and asking them about you know anecdotes uh, and uh, details because they wanted to make sure to be free as artists but at the same time to have that language a language that will reach if, 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 if pockets of population that usually were not exposed to theater especially in italy in, in those years yes absolutely and one other question it's already in the title that you gave to your film it's it's a novel for two and it's the relationship between the two of them. It, it, it's a great love story. It's one of the great public love stories that Italy has witnessed, a very unconventional one. And at the same time, I'm very interested in the, uh, in the since you had direct access, you knew them personally, and you knew them very well too. Uh, it was a great love story, and there was always some sort of dialectic uh, or conflict, good conflict. Like not always good. <laughs> uh, not always good. What, was, what appeared was like, um, and I wanted to know, did, 
there are the interview while Dario is walking and the interview when Franca is seated. The interview with, da with Dario took place after Franca died? Or she was still alive? No, she was, no, no, they were still, she was still alive. alive. Yeah, yeah, we, but we, you interviewed we, them separately. You, yeah. did, you didn't sit them down together. And we prepared, everyth we prepared everything for the interview. We followed them all around mm -hmm. Italy for their tour. And then everything was you know, decided. And Dario was Dario. I was like, I'm not doing this. I was like, okay, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> no, I feel like walking. And, and we had to do the interview, like walking for two hours, which was complicated because of course the audio was like this and this and the focus, a lot of things are out of focus. And, and in a way it was good because Daria, um, because uh, Franca felt that she had the main attention. That was my question. Hours yeah. of interview. So she, Franca was, th was still there, and, and, but they were separate. Separate. And she could be herself because sometimes she, she struggled to assert the fact that she was not only a great actress, and we have to re remind you that Franca was already a very accomplished, very famous actress before meeting Absolutely. Dario. And, and without Franca, I think I don't think Dario would have had this worldwide um, attention, and and his plays wouldn't have been played all over the place. Uh, um, it was was delicate. I mean, the strategy that we had to put in place in order to shoot this film was <laughs> very imagine. delicate because L Lorena was great in dealing with Franca and and establishing a trust with her as a woman and the fact that she was very active in the women's movement, etc. And I had to deal with Dario that sometimes you know he would go in a different place, so we were ready with the crew in one place, and he was all of a sudden in a completely different place, and we were calling him and say, Dario. We had a, an appointment here, and he said, oh, I forgot, sorry. Come here, and we had to travel like miles in order to get to him. Uh, but it was, it, was, uh, it was a very fascinating project on how you were asking how it started at the beginning. We started to work on this, on this film uh, three years before Dario got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and everything started when Franca, she knew that it was in the filmmaking field. At the time, in Mil I was living in Milano still, and she called me one day and said, Filippo, can you please come over? Uh, I have a lot of um, film reels in my basement. I said, are you keeping your film in your basement with the humidity? You're going to destroy your credit. You cannot keep film in the basement. It, it, it's going to destroy in, in a few months. She said, no, I don't know what it is. I, you have to come and see. Give me some advice. So I went there, and I found some incredible material that never saw the light before. Like the Mistero Buffo of 1969, the black and white version was filmed, there was only the negative there. It never had been broadcasted before. It was a trove of um, incredible material archival, including the Icarus, including uh, the Fanfani Rapito, the Kidnap Fanfani, and um, uh, it was incredible how the material we had. And so sh she said, okay, tell me what to do. And I, we, we curated the, the uh, restoration of the archival in a major production house co company in Milano. So we, we transferred everything to video, hours, you know, dozens of hours of uh, material that were not known to the, to the public before. Even RAI didn't have all this material that we recovered. So that was, that was great because it was a way for us to not only to do a portrait of them as, as artists, and, but also to recover some material that would illustrate at best their work in for, you know, they, they did for in theater. And I just want to pursue this issue of the relationship between the two of them because I, I really find it fascinating. You said that probably uh, Dario wouldn't have become what he became without Franca. So I want to know in your opinion, in both your opinions, what is that Franca brought to the couple and what is that Dario brought to the couple from a, from a professional point of view? So what, what is the component that each of them brought in that also changed the other in some way? Franca said she was very famous, but she was more of a sort of a pin-up girl. She was like of the generation of the Lolo Bridget, of the Sophia Lauren. She was beautiful. She was stunning beautiful. And she had these character of the beautiful uh, girl with the strong personality and she becomes something different during her 
professional partnership with, with Ford. And so I just wanted to know what, what is that exchange between the two of them? What was the professional exchange that went on? I think that uh, Dario was for sure very free and uh, he was really ahead of his times. And he had that kind of genius. It was a real, he, uh, he would impersonate, you know, embody what, what mean, what to be a free playwright means. But he was, he didn't have any structure, so he couldn't find a pair of socks. So all, also the research, she was behind that. Okay. The amount of, the, or, you know, the research was a huge part of his work, and that's also the reason why he had become worldwide and also recognized with the Nobel. Because his work, even when it seems like very futile, or it's always, it has a lot of depth. And, uh, like in Mistero Buffo, for example, there's a lot of research on all the apocryphal gospels. And it, there is nothing that he says that is not documented. So she was really the protagonist of this research, you're saying. She gave him method, basically. She gave him method, and then uh, Dario wouldn't uh, perform anything that was not screened and double-checked with her. He really wanted her approval and she was very tough and very she was smart she was very sharp so for sure he was creatively he was so you know he was bursting mm -hmm. with that fire but also i think she gave her she gave him structure order and also she would challenge him to go deeper and farther because he was one of those personalities where nobody would challenge. And, and that it was, they, they both, you know, they were very nice and fun, but they were a piece of work <laughs> yes. to, to be around. All the people who work with them, they could be very happy one day, and the other day is like, we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> what's going to happen. They were very, in that sense, you know, strong will and not always super organized. But, but Dario without Franca, he was really half of the person he was. That's my... No, I, I totally agree. I don't have much to add to this, except that, for example, when, when the Canzonissima thing happened, and they were censored uh, for decades from Italian television, uh, they were there's this, it's in the interview, also in the documentary. They they were sitting down together on Can the bed. Can just it was mentioned briefly. It it was the most important TV show in Italy for decades. So it was the Saturday night TV show that the whole country stopped to watch, and. To be the uh, MCs of Canzonissima was your achievement. It meant that you made it. Uh, and ev off. everybody yeah. who became the MC of Canzonissima went on having extraordinary careers, making tons of money, and being constantly on TV. So they quit in the middle of it. They, they quit in the middle because they wanted to keep their artistic freedom mm -hmm. and to say things that they wanted to say. And there is this... Um, phrase of, of uh, in the documentary where Franca says, you know, at a certain point, we're sitting on the bed together and saying, what are we going to do? Are we going to continue? What What's going to happen if we leave Cansonism? It's going to be a disaster. And then they talk to each other and say, listen, we have the theater. We can go on with this. We, we cannot give up uh, our freedom. We cannot give up. Um, what we want to say in, in our art, especially. And they, they made a very courageous choice because, again, you're right, they left one of the most uh, important shows in Italy that would have you know, made them well for, for life, basically. So that was very... They were very principled artists. Very principled artists. It was the, they were inspiring from that point of view. I have to say, I haven't seen, I don't know about you, I haven't seen this documentary for maybe 20 years because it was in 98, he went 19, to yeah. Venice. And we had all this material. And then when he got the, the Nobel, of course, we had to rush and, and get ready for the festival and everything. And now looking at all the material that I know we have, you know, it it brings back, thank you very much for showing, because it brings back this, you know, need to say we have to go back. There is so beautiful material that needs to be re-edited and, and needs a life because... 
You know. And I'm sorry I've monopolized the conversation. As you can tell, I got really excited about this. So, but I don't, I don't want to. And you know, since uh, Dario and Franca gave an example of how you should always interact with your audience, please uh, have some questions for our guests. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, yes. yes. is that um, I was able to see them at a workshop at Columbia University where they shone separately. Dario did the Zani skit from Estero Buffo, and Franca did this incredible monologue of a woman who was raped and then shamed by the police, and it just built. And I'm assuming that she wrote the whole thing, but they were incredible on stage. Uh, there was a huge crowd, and I was able to sit on stage because all the seats were taken, and just to look up and watch him, he was a force of nature, and really one of the greats in theater of all time. My question is, um, does what they did continue as a traditional political theater? In other words, were there people in his company who have gone on to do the same thing, or what kind of political theater like they did exist, if at all, in Italy now? It's a tough question because I think those were very unique and particular times. Uh, I don't think they really left an incredible legacy. The company dissolved, uh, I think, in the late 80s, yeah. right? Yeah. And right. many of them kept uh, doing uh, engaged theater, but nothing remotely close to what Daria and Franca did. And, uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if um, I'm not aware of such a you know theater like there. It's still something like that in Italy. I, I may say just one thing is that we try here to bring you know within the very uh, contained limits of the stage also theater from Italy, and we have a um, yearly theater festival in China, and I think there is still in Italian theater uh, an element of political activism. And of course, it's very different from the kind that you had in the 70s, where uh, the social struggle and the conditions of the working class were really at the center of it. And now I think you, sh you, you find it more uh, careful to other themes, for example, immigration and cultural integration of minorities. And I think here we had some um, very good um, examples of that. We had the Teatro delle Albe, uh, for example, uh, Marco Martinelli. Last year we had, uh, last um, June, no, last May here, we had uh, a young Albanian-Italian um, actor who did a one-man show called Albania Casa Mia, or um, the, the English translation was Sweet Home Albania. It's a monologue in which he reconstructs the way in which he arrived in Italy. Uh, as a three three months old baby, uh, as a clandestine, on so there is still that element in in Italian theater. There is theater as a sort of a social critique or a political critique of society. It, it has taken different venues. It, it is exploring what are now the, the central points of um, of Italian political and social life. That's in my opinion. You don't you don't find like much emphasis on, on social struggle or, or class difference, but it's, it, it, it's exploring different situations. And right now, for example, we are thinking of bringing here um, a, a piece that is about um, the post-colonial Italian experience, I, like our experience with African immigrants now, and what was the experience of Italians in Africa when they went there as colonizers during fascism. So it's a, it's, a show, it's a show that brings together and creates a parallel between these two movements, and one was as an aggressor uh, during the colonial wars of fascism and post-unitarian Italy, and the waves of immigration that we have now. So I would say that there is still, uh, it's very different from, from what uh, Dario and Franca did, and fortunately it's different, because the, the world is a different place, and Italy is a different country. 
And uh, I, I would say that these now are our political emergencies, but... And it's a different social class Absolutely. fight. Uh, does uh, censorship and blacklisting, as there was 10, 20 years ago, still exist today in, um, in Italy? That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think... Do you want to say I, something? I, I'm, I think it probably exists in different forms. Uh, I'm not more subtle in different ways. I'm not uh, a specialist on that particular field, so we should really ask someone who's studying the, that phenomenon. But I think, um, as, as he said, it's, it's a different context now. It's a different social and political context, so censorship is probably used in a, in a different way. Uh, no, what I would say is that they experience the kind of censorship where uh, it used to be that you had to submit the script and, and you really had the process that you can or you cannot say something. And now you still have to do that in television, more or less. But uh, uh, it's more the censorship that we have now, I would say, it's more like when you have the national, I don't know, the nightly news or the major newspapers, the way they choose what to say and what not to say, that is a kind of censorship that we have not. Of course, we have the social media that have allowed things to come out and to surface way easier than it used to be 60, 70 years ago. But I would say that the censorship that we, we experience now is way more subtle because we think that it doesn't exist because we have access to information. And actually, you know, it's a question mark about the source and the way the information are distributed. And, uh, Oh, when did he leave? When did they leave Canzonissimo and why? Early 60s. Yeah, it was not. If, if I remember well, I should go back and, and, and double check, but they, they left Canzonissimo in 1962. I, I watched them. I used to watch it every week. Yeah, that's when they. They. they there was censorship uh, after they um, put on scene a, uh, a, a specific, uh, no, no, it was a specific uh, show on uh, uh, job security. And there was, I think they reenacted um, a piece where there was a worker falling down from a scaffold and dying. That was the, that was the, the thing that they, they they rehearsed on the on the show on television. It was the first channel of Italian TV that was had was widespread, and 60 million people were, were watching. So and that hurt, um, and was um, was not liked by the by the government. That something like this never went on TV before. No, nobody. It was a musical show, and they did something on the style of Canzonissima, but they did that particular, you know, uh, f I mean, they, 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 that particular situation, they, they did it with theater in, I mean, in, uh, in the show. So they used the same language of the show, but they portrayed something that never had been in the public opinion, under the eyes of the public opinion, like that way. So that was the major event that um, after and after that, the censorship told them that you you cannot do that anymore. We have to say just to continue on, on censorship that of course Italian television at this point there was only one channel, and it was uh, state run, and that was the only TV show that the government had full control over it. So it was not that it was competing that you had like ten channels, not even two channels. It was one. It was run by the government at eleven p.m. all the broadcast would finish so people would go to bed and wake up on time to go to work the morning after. And uh, 
um, dancers could not have naked legs, so they had very thick black stockings for the dancing. So it, it sounds like we're talking about the Middle Ages, but you know, these were these were the 60s in Italy, and there was very strict control. And of course, um, everybody was watching TV, even if not every household had television. But people would gather in their homes of people that had one, or in in, in bars and and and, and cafes. And um, totally, because you, you would attract uh, your friends and family to come to you if you allowed them to come. And it, you know, television was so strategic that just to give you an example, during a, an audience of uh, Giulio Andreotti, that as you know was uh, Prime Minister of Italy many, many times, uh, and Pope Pius XII, Pius XII asked Andreotti, but you cannot allow this. Have you seen last night? I don't, I don't know, watch TV program. And Andreotti said, no, I'm sorry, Your Holiness. I, I don't have enough time to watch TV. And you know what the Pope replied? Well, since 50 million of Italians watch TV every night, you better watch TV too. <laughs> <laughs> so just to give you a sense of, of what it meant, and, and in Italian TV of that time, Cantonissima was the flagship program that everybody watched. And again, it was, yes, it was mostly songs, but between one song and the other, they would have little comical skits or intermissions with, with guests. And of course, Dario and Franca tried to add some, some sort of social critique within that very unusual uh, frame that was... They were reaching out to a huge audience. But Absolutely. But also Federico Fellini was with uh, La Dolce Vita, the scene of the uh, vision of the Madonna was yes. heavily criticized by the church, remember? It was more or less the same, probably in 65, 63, 63. So it was in the same time frame, I remember. And there was nothing they could do with, with the cinema, whereas in television they. No, exactly. Yeah. Television is way more popular at the time, too. Eugenio. I was there in 1962 preparing the coffee. Because the friends uh, of my family, they were joining on, you know, the family on Saturday night. So everybody was there watching Canzonissima. And I remember then few years later, many years later, that I was so happy, so excited, and many Italians were so excited in watching on TV Mr. Robuffo. You remember? Yes, I do. Yes. And uh, that... Ah, you see? <laughs> so, yes, so that was like a revenge in some way, a return, a huge return on public TV again. And so I would like to ask you, because, you know, you were there, and what was the reaction of Dario and Franca to getting that incredible success? You mean in Italy or in... in, in it, no, there's reaction, their own reaction, the satisfaction to be back on TV? I, I don't remember if we uh, spoke to them about this in particular, but of course, for them, going back uh, to their audience it was, a, was a good uh, achievement, a great achievement, because um, they had, the, the interesting thing is that they had a, a wide network and a wide audience on unofficial venues, like in the 70s, they went, they were going to occupied factories to help the workers. Uh, they were, you know, uh, uh, rehearsing and, and playing their plays at the um, in the huge stadiums in Italy, all over the place. So it's not that they needed television in order to have their art seen by the public, but of course. Going back to to public television after all those years meant that they solidified the the audience that they uh, gathered in all those years while they were out of TV, and it was it was a good thing I think in in general because they were able to um, build their own audience outside the institutional model, and then it was actually the institutional model that was forced to recognize who they were and their, you know, the, the, the great art they were making. I want to add something. They really, they didn't care that much. I, I was struck hearing them. They had that need of just connecting to the people. 
When we needed the release of the film, they were at Cesenatico. So it's like, no, I mean, come to the beach. And we were coming to New York. And uh, we, we Cesenatico is the Italian version of the Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good one. <laughs> so that is the idea. They were on the shore playing cards with all the people of, you know, the locals, and, and, uh, and, and they were talking about, and they were having, you know, the journalists would call, and the, all the organizers, they would call, and they were very interested in asking, let's go to the south, let's go to big schools. They wanted to, to go in uh, Palazzetti dello Sport, in a small, you know, sport arenas. arenas or uh, in schools and uh, in, in the squares, public squares, that they were really, they were drawn to that. They wanted the co to be connected with real people. They were not that interested. Even when we followed them in major theaters, they were very disengaged. They were not, they, they, they felt, and I remember Franca once being in Rome after, you know, a, a sort of three or four nights of sold out, she was she was upset with him and she was arguing with Dario because they were you know the outlet one of the other she's like we can't do this that's not our audience uh, we, whom are we talking to so they really wanted to go and talk to the people that they felt were not listened to or they felt that there were people that didn't have the chance to you know go to the theater and, and listen to the plays but thank you, Eugenia, for the question. And definitely, I believe though, that when they went back to television, uh, and not like as guests in a TV show, but that their own show, it was like a, a weekly uh, appointment with Dario Fo and Franca Rame, where they presented really major, major. That probably meant the real reconnection with the, uh, with the nation. It's an, it was a national, global, that many people who had never seen them or heard of them had access to them. I think that really was a changing point in, uh, you know, the political situation was slowly changing. It was not that kind of um, um, grassroots control that you would have in the 60s. And that for me, for example, it was the first time I ever heard of them. And it was my first year of high school. And it really opened up a world. And that from that moment, I started, you know, following what they were doing in theaters and so on. But that really probably for people of my generation was the first time we had, we had access to it. One last question. Is there a reason why there aren't very many excerpts from her one woman show? Because I remember seeing it at the Joyce and it was one of the most spectacular evenings of theater I think I've ever seen. Of her? Uh, yes. We didn't have access to good material. You know, unfortunately, he is widely covered, and uh, her, I mean, this was in 96, because now they have rescued a lot of beautiful material with Franca. But uh, what happened is that, especially in the 70s and 80s, he would do, I think that Franca started having her own uh, stage, I would say late 80s, and uh, anyways, in 96, we did not have access. We, we had only a few things here and there with no audio. And now I know that in the past 12, 13 years, they have rescued wonderful material of her, uh, of her plays. May I just interject one thing, Stefano? Yes. Professor Ballerini, of course. Are you sure that wasn't NYU? Richard. It was in Colombia. Because we had Dario Fo for the first time ever in the United States at 19 university plays. And, uh, and the, that night, uh, they performed exactly the uh, raped scene of uh, the, and, and the mystery buff. And then. Uh, when five, because we tried to get them here once before, but uh, Mr. Fanfani, who had been uh, uh, made fun of by Dario Fo in the Fanfani Rapito, made sure that the American government would not grant a permission 
So this is the first uh, example, I think, of a country that uh, asks another country not to admit <laughs> one of its own citizens. Sometimes I think of Jean-Paul Sartre, of what we, he would have done if a communist Frenchman uh, had asked to go to the United States. Imagine France asking f the United States not to allow a Frenchman in, but Italy On political exactly grounds. that. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Ballerini was at NYU at that time, and, and he was the first director of the Casa. And um, remind us the year, please. Lanno. Oh, God, 75, maybe. Okay. And he didn't, he didn't do the... Um, the, um, the, uh, the anarchico? No, he did a number of s s scenes. Of, uh, in fact, the gentleman you have photographed, uh, you have in the, in the film, was his translator on stage. Right. Ron Jenkins, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have laughed. <laughs> so he had, he had a great translate, and people really split the, their sides when, 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 when they came. In those cases, there were, there were two ovations. The first ovation was by the Italian audience, and the second ovation, like a few seconds away from the, in the American audience. It was, it was funny, you were talking about the political censorship of Dario Fo not, not being allowed in the United States. What, what actually really happened with the accidental death of an anarchist in the, ninth, in the beginning, early 80s, was the American producer of the Broadway show uh, that was going to happen uh, with Jonathan Price who was going to be the actor, he asked um, the, uh, to have Dario Fo, the playwright, at, in, on Broadway to check the, the play before it was going to go on scene. And the State Department said, no, he's a communist, he's a subversive. We're not going to give him a visa. So the, the producer of the show uh, said, what can I do? I need the playwright here to check the production. So what he did, he was, a, he was genius, actually. He worked on the final... That's, I don't know if it's a legend, if it's true, but what it, it looks like, if, if he, he called the State Department and said, listen, uh, I'm going to have this show, I'm producing this show on Broadway with Jonathan Price, inspired to, to this play of Dario Fo. I need the playwright in the US to check the show. And they said no. And he says, listen, if the, uh, the show doesn't go well financially, I'll sue you for damages. Because they didn't let the playwright in. They gave him a seven-day visa because of that. That was the only way to get Dario Fo into the U.S. One other thing I just want to mention was that uh, NYU's uh, acting department, the students, did a production of uh, We Won't Pay, We Won't Pay. Oh. Uh, it was about eight years ago. It was quite wonderful. Okay. Did you see that? Uh, no, I, I didn't. It was quite wonderful, and they opened it with Bella Chow. <laughs> But thank you also for put, thank you, Professor Ballerini, also for putting back uh, NYU in the Dario Fo map <laughs> at, 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 uh, in the U.S. And thank you so much, Filippo, and uh, it was wonderful. Thank you for allowing us to show your documentary. And of course, thank you for being here to share this very, very important uh, piece of Italian theater history, not only Italian theater. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you.